Good morning, everyone. It's beautiful to see you on this nice sunny morning. One of the my favorite things is this time of morning in the sanctuary where the light comes through those red pieces of stained glass and there's just these little spots of red everywhere. But it's beautiful to see that in your faces and to know that others are joining us online. So wherever you may be, welcome to worship with Christ United Methodist Church. I'm Pastor Janet Wilson, pleased to be leading in worship today. And I'll start out with just some gratitude for all who served and all who came to the Swiss Steak Dinner last night, our first of 2024. Um, we, we found some favor in the weather and just had a really good turnout for such a cold night and all went well and I am just always so amazed at how really a pretty small number of people <laughs> come together to make this happen and how good it is to be in community. So thank you for that. Um, and there are some things left from the dinner. A lot of meat and gravy and coleslaw, right, and a little bit of potatoes. So those will be available for, for sale or donation after worship today. So all that being said, thank you for being here. May we join in worship with body, mind, heart, and spirit on this morning. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. We gather together in the name of the living Christ to worship God. Surely God is in this place and calls us to worship in spirit and in truth. God's love is for you and for all people everywhere. That we may share God's love and life, may we be renewed in the refreshing spirit of the living Christ. The living Christ is with us. Praise the Lord. Please join me in prayer. God of our fathers and mothers of all generations who have come before us, holy is your name. We gather in your presence with praise and thanksgiving for the faithful love you have shown toward your people, for the many blessings you have given to us. Your promises are eternal, and they are backed by the honor of your name. Thank you for your faithful presence among us, even when we are not fully aware of it. Continue to reveal yourself to us. Open our eyes to see you here among us. Open our ears to hear your word, for surely you are with us in this place. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Well, you will notice we're... We're down a worship leader today, but we have very capable song leaders in their place. So Sue and Sandy and Diane will be helping lead our music through this time. So we thank them for that, and we thank Gary for being all the tech tanks on this day. So we're going to start with immortal, immortal, invisible, God only wise, just remembering the might and the power of God that we see so often in these early stories in the Bible. Immortal, invisible, God only one, in my heart, most blessed. Victorious, thy great name we praise. Unresting, unhasting, and silent as light, nor wanting, nor wasting, thou rulest in might. Thy justice, like mountains high, soaring above, thy clouds, which are fountains of goodness and love. Oh, it thou givest to both great and small, in all life thou livest the true life of all. We blossom and flourish. 
fresh as leaves on the tree and wither and perish but not changeth thee thou reignest in glory thy dwellest in light thy angels adore thee all veiling their sight now lord we would render our hope us to see tis only the splendor of light hideth thee we did it <laughs> we come now to a time of offering in our worship service a time of giving back to god of gifts in a different way than we did last night and that our friends just did this morning were called in so many ways to just return the cycle of love and gift and generosity with and for God. So in this time, may you give as the Holy Spirit leads you to give, and may it be a blessing to you and to God. Please rise in body or spirit as we sing our prayer and our praise in the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God all creatures here below. Alleluia, alleluia. Praise God, the source of all our gifts. Praise Jesus Christ, whose power uplifts. Praise the Spirit, Holy Spirit. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. alleluia. Generous and giving God we thank you. We thank you for a wonderful Swiss steak dinner in which our gifts were shared and the gifts of the community returned. And not just the food, but the fellowship and the friendships that are made there. We return these monetary gifts to you that you may use them to help us, to lead us, to empower us, to inspire us, to create your kingdom here as it is on heaven. We give you all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So it is children's time. If Elijah and or Anna want to come up in our experimentation, I have recruited a skilled teaching professional <laughs> in Diane <laughs> to, to help with this process. So. We have someone who's done some teaching of small children <laughs> in her life who's going to lead us through. Are you ready to hear a story today, Elijah? Well, last week, P Pastor Janet told us about Abraham and how God promised that he would have many descendants, as, a, as many descendants as the stars in the sky. Abraham had a son named Isaac, and he had a son named Jacob, and Jacob had a son named Joseph. Today, we're going to read about Joseph and his color. 
Joseph was one of Jacob's 12 sons. Jacob loved him more than all his other sons. Jacob made Joseph a colorful robe. His brothers were jealous. They warned, they wore nice robes too, and they wanted to be loved as much as Joseph was loved. Joseph had a dream. He told his family, we were building grain from the field. Your bundles of grain bowed down to mine. Then Joseph had another dream. He said, this time the sun and the moon and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. His father asked, does this mean our family will bow down to you someday? The brothers were even more angry. They threw Joseph into a dry well. Along came some traitors. The brothers sold Joseph to them as a slave. They lied to their father and said Joseph had been killed by a wild animal, but God was with Joseph. So, have you ever gotten a new coat? Did Mommy and Daddy buy you a new coat this winter? You want to see the book? There you go. Okay. Get the thing, Father Abraham, last week, and I think everybody needs to be able to experience the Father Abraham song. So, if everybody who is able, will you please stand up? Sure. Father Abraham, if you don't know it, um, It's a very easy song. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons have Father Abraham. I'm one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. (laughs) He's running to praise the Lord. Okay. Come and help us sing, Elijah. Can you come help us sing? Can you help us sing a song? Okay. We'll start. He'll join us. Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham, I'm one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord, right arm, left arm, Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham, I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord, right arm, left arm, right leg, left leg, Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham, I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord, right arm, left arm, right leg, right arm, uh, left leg. <laughs> Head up, turn around, Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I'm one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Right arm, left arm, right leg, left leg. Head up, head down, turn around, sit down. (laughs) Let's say a little prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for all of your, for being with us and for loving us. We praise you in your name. Amen. Good job. Thank you for joining us. See you next week. <laughs> all right. In our experiment, we've learned it's a lot more fun when Diane leads it. <laughs> Diane's like, can we sing all the old Sunday school songs, which I don't know, (laughs) because I didn't go to Sunday school when I was a child, so I'm happy to learn them along with you. (laughs) Some I learned in VBS at Chapel Hill, but anyway. Um, We come now, after our exercise in singing and fun, to a time of prayer, Um, so I will just ask you to be in that attitude. We're going to pray especially for Sue, who is having knee number two uh, made bionic this week, and for Jim 
and Roger as they continue to travel. They're in Palm Springs this morning. They head to California tomorrow to see one of the daughters. So please pray with me, my friends. Loving God, we are so grateful for your presence with us and our presence together in worship today for the service and the fun and the fellowship and the laughter and the music and the family that happen in this place. May we continue just to build that outward person by person, ripple by ripple, as we love you and share your love with others. Lord, we do ask you to be with Sue and this week with her medical team and her spirit, with her family as they care for her and all that happens when you have a surgery. She's done this once already this year, but I don't know if that makes it easier or harder. So may you just be with her in every step. Please be with Jim and Roger as they travel and all those who are moving about the world in this time of snowbirding. May you just keep them safe as they travel away from their spring and summer and fall homes. Loving God, we just ask your presence in a world, a world still racked with conflict and violence, particularly in Israel and Gaza, the, the places that we are reading about so intensely as we read through Genesis and Exodus. May they sit a little deeper in our hearts as we imagine that these are the spaces that you have given to the Hebrew people, and yet they are a land shared by peoples before them, and how all of that fits. May you bring your peace, your calm, your compassion, your love to the situation. We are so grateful that you are with us in everything, in every moment, and that you love us. Hear the words of your gathered people this morning as we pray the prayer taught by your Son. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. For our song, kind of preparing for the word, um, there are lots of names of God that are given, particularly in these first two books of the Bible, and El Shaddai is one that is used often, and so we're going to sing just the basic um, version that is in the hymnal through twice on this day. El Shaddai, El Shaddai, El Adonai, age to age or still the same. By the power of the name, El Shaddai, El Shaddai, El Eyana Adonai, age to age or still the same. Whoops. By the power <laughs> okay. Of Wait a minute. Name. We, we, yeah. We, we need to start over. What page is that on? I wasn't quite, we haven't got the words quite right up there. If you want to turn to your hymnal, it's one, page 123. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <clears throat> El Shaddai, El Shaddai, El Age to age or still the same, by the power of the name. El Shaddai, El Shaddai, 
Scripture lesson for today is Genesis 37, 3 through 11. Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day, Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. But his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't say a kind word to him. One night, Joseph had a dream, and when he told his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. Listen to this dream, he said. We were, in a, we were out in a field, tying up bundles of grain. Suddenly, my bundle stood up, and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. His brothers responded, so you think you will be our king, do you? Do you actually think you will reign over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dreams and the way he talked about them. Soon Joseph had another dream, and again he told his brothers about it. Listen, I have had another dream, he said. The sun, moon, and eleven stars bowed low before me. This time he told the dream to his father as well as to his brothers. But his father scolded him. What kind of dream is that, he asked. Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow to the ground before you? But while his brothers were jealous of Joseph, his father wondered what the dreams meant. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Joseph. He is something, isn't he? Week three of our the Bible year exploration finds us at the end of the stories of the patriarchs with the page turning tale of Jacob and his sons, including Joseph and his time in Egypt. Eventually we hear the opening story of Moses and how the story, how the Hebrew people in Egypt plays out through the beginning of Exodus. Before we enter the stories, a reminder of a few things we've learned. This is definitely a different time, place, culture, and context, isn't it? Multiple wives, lots of kids, moving around, kings and empires, and a high level of threat and violence are all part of the Old Testament world. We have a couple of tools that we've identified to help us as we read. So slide, next slide, Gary. There you go. A particular passage or story might seem to be descriptive, telling us what happened, where and how, and an awful lot of what we've read so far has been descriptive. It's a story, it's a narration of what is happening, it might be prescriptive, telling the hearers of the story then and now what to do and how to be a follower of God. One of the places we read this this week is in the Passover story, as God asked the Hebrews to do very particular things to get ready for the Exodus and then tells them they're going to keep doing those. We'll talk a little bit more about that next week, but it's really prescriptive. And then predictive. What will happen if? 
what will happen when. Sometimes it's a consequence, sometimes it's a prophecy. And in our reading again this week is God is telling Moses what to do and what will happen and they will harden God's heart. There's some predictive part of the story in that. So prescriptive, descriptive, and predictive kind of help us to figure out what's happening as we read. And um, the other kind of tool that we found is that we're looking for the three-part series that often unfolds. Next slide, Gary. Starts with a call or a blessing from God, and then goes to a covenant or promise, and followed by rebellion or consequences for breaking that covenant. And that's a rhythm that we see again and again as we move through the story. So, that being said, let's pray and get ready to enter in. Please pray with me. El Shaddai, Almighty God, we thank you for this story and for the time to, to delve in, to read it in arcs that we might not have before, to compare the words to the pictures in our head and what we learned in Sunday school and from musicals and from reading brief passages through the years. May you just continue to enlarge the story in our minds and our hearts that we may better understand your people through time, that we may better understand the arrival of your son on earth and what that meant, and that we may better know you. We give you all this. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you. Amen. We began this week's readings with the continued story of Jacob, the son of Isaac, away from his homeland, his parents, his brother Esau, and his immediate relatives. Jacob Jacob goes to the land of his father's uncle Laban. Mark and I had to spend a few minutes sorting out that family tie (laughs) this morning. And he works for 14 years to earn the right to marry two sisters, first Leah and then Rachel. And he helps his father or his uncle-in-law, I guess, raise crops and livestock, and he makes a home with them. Beautiful Rachel is the apple of his eye and yet has a difficult time conceiving. Plainer Rachel is fruitful and has six sons before Rachel conceives. And as Rachel waits in a familiar story from where we've been already, she asked her servant Bilhah to lie with Jacob. So several years, two wives, two concubines, 12 sons, and one, un- one, known, one known daughter later, we have the family of Jacob. Again, we may not quite understand the context and the culture all of the time, But there's no condemnation for God in this situation. In fact, God keeps blessing it. And that tells us a great deal about the relationship between the people and God and what was the code of the time. The family, Jacob's family, eventually makes their way back to the land of Canaan. It's a little conniving and deceiving by Jacob as he leaves (laughs) the Laban's family, kind of reminiscent of what happened back home with Rebecca and Esau with a little wrestling along a river where Jacob claims his own blessing and gains the name Israel. Eventually, Jacob's family is reunited with that of Esau's and they all see Isaac and Rebecca before the matriarch and patriarch of that family pass on. But as we heard earlier, Jacob has one clear favorite son, Joseph, who possesses, I think, the beauty and the charm of Rachel. He's he's the favorite because Rachel is the favorite. As we have learned from the time of Cain and Abel, parental favoritism is not a helpful thing in family dynamics, is it? Keeps getting everybody in trouble. Neither are dreams that indicate your brothers will be bowing down to you in the future. When Jacob gives Joseph that beautiful coat, sometimes described as many colors, it's the straw that breaks the brothers' backs. 
They first concoct a plan to kill him, then leave him in a well to die, and finally sell him off to nomadic tra traders as a slave, telling a distraught and grieving Jacob that his favorite son is dead. Joseph lands in Egypt in the household of Potiphar, kind of the chief of staff to the Pharaoh, and Joseph, Joseph is a slave. In that household, Joseph's status and fortune kind of come and go as his charm and ability help him succeed and his looks garner attention from Potiphar's wife that land him in jail for a time. And his skill at dreaming and telling dreams come back to help him. Eventually, famine comes to the land of Jacob and 10 of the remaining sons head to Egypt to buy the grain they have heard is available. Joseph knows who they are right away, but his brothers don't recognize him, and partly he's dressing and being as an Egyptian in this time. Joseph seems to put his brothers through some tests, and he plays a bit of cat and mouse with them as he deals with what I think are some really big feelings, as my daughter's family would say, there's big feelings all over in Joseph. But ultimately, he softens his heart. There's just a couple passages where he breaks down in tears away from the scene just to kind of deal and let his heart soften once again. God affirms um, this reunion with his brothers and his father and the move uh, to Egypt for Jacob and his family and offers his blessing in that once more feels like whenever there's a big choice to be made, a move kind of away from what we might think the expected path is, now they're moving away from the land of Canaan. Why are they doing that? Well, they don't have any food. They don't have any grain. They're starving. So the Pharaoh and Joseph invite them to relocate to a fertile part of the kingdom, Goshen, and 70 of them or so do so. All right with my pointer for a minute. So if we look at kind of this region, we have Jerusalem and Bethel and Shechem, and we heard those names a lot. So this is kind of what we think of as Israel, the Dead Sea, the Sea of Galilee is up there. So this is the region of the New Testament and Joseph. But um, the traders kind of take Joseph along the shore and down into Egypt, which is across the Sinai Peninsula, as it remains and still on the Mediterranean Sea. And this is the Nile. So the biggest city in Egypt is right at the Nile Delta. It's fertile, there's lots of water, um, it's easy to grow crops there. And then Goshen is kind of this land up here. So that's kind of the geography of this story at this point, and we'll see that next week as we start talking about how uh, the Israelites get from here back to there in the, in the Exodus. So Gary, maybe just go back to the title slide for a bit. So I had to ponder a bit about the place of God in this story. It's really more like a page-turning narrative what happens next, what happens next. And as I thought about it, at this point, the Hebrew people are really just operating on several blessings from God, the covenant of circumcision that they have made, and a lot of marked memorials to God through Canaan and kind of down along this pathway. It feels like whenever God moves in mighty ways, one of these patriarchs builds some sort of memorial or monument to God that are named. I don't know how well they really know this God who keeps showing up in big ways and then sort of disappearing for a time, letting them fumble their way through. There's not really a religion in any sense yet. The Ten Commandments and all that follows are waiting on Mount Sinai for another hero and another day. Yet there is some sense of God and of destiny for Joseph. One of the phrases that reoccurs again and again in this narrative is, and God was with him. 
so Joseph knew God was with him. The tellers of the story knew that God was with him. After Jacob's death in Egypt, the brothers are afraid that Joseph will give them some very earned payback for their behavior earlier. Instead, Joseph says this in chapter 50, don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. And so we're remembering that the dreams that Joseph interpreted in Egypt led to some stockpiling of grain. And that grain is what's being shared with his family and brothers and the ability to survive in Egypt is the gift that he is giving. Don't know what happened, would have happened to Jacob's family had they remained in the land of Canaan instead of going to Egypt. We are told Jacob, Joseph lived until 110 in the land of Egypt alongside Jacob's family, seeing three generations grow and multiply around him. God is in this story for the long haul. You know, we've gone from pretty tight, small families to 70 people coming in and um, being fruitful over generations. And a side note before we continue, we may all have some fictionalized versions of these stories that live large in our minds and hearts. Years ago, I enjoyed a book by Anita Diamante called The Red Tent that is told through the perspective of the women in the Jacob story from Rachel and Leah, Bilhah and Zipporah, not Zipporah. Zilpah. We're just gonna go with the Z, the Z woman. And their children, but their thoughts and their perspective and how their lives were. Mark and I enjoy musicals and Andrew Lloyd Webber's Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat is a favorite. We rewatched it again last weekend, and I was reminded of how closely some parts stick to the text and story, and how the songs and the live action that are added just kind of illuminate it for me, much like happened with A Christmas Carol, right? A lot of that followed the text, and then there were other things that kind of brought it to life. And Moses and the Exodus is a story we may know best from movies. The Ten Commandments, did I remember watching that every year around Easter when I was a kid? The Prince of Egypt or Exodus, God and Kings. And it's recounted in the Jewish Passover meal and there are echoes in every communion that we celebrate together. And differing versions of the story do help me expand my imagination about what might have been, again, different contexts and time and culture but I've really enjoyed reading alongside of that to really know what is written and kind of compare the two in my mind. I think we all have to decide if creative imaginings of the stories expand our idea of what might have been or if they limit it. I was reminded as I read though that this is an oral tradition for centuries and it's not too hard to imagine a wandering storyteller adding music and props and life to this page turning what happens next story. Now we literally turn the page and move out of Genesis into Exodus. At the end of Genesis, Joseph is aging and we're talking about the generations. As we begin the book of Exodus, Joseph has died. The Pharaoh who he served has died. And all those who remember how he came to be in Egypt and how Joseph helped Egypt to survive have also died. The Hebrews who have remained there have continued to thrive and multiply and grow within the Egyptian kingdom for about 350 years, 20 or so generations since the time of Joseph. Does, can you, do you know stories 20 generations ago? Could you point to the facts 20 generations ago? The Hebrews are slaves. They're useful, but they're despised. They're not Egyptian, to be sure. And that was a bit of a 
purebred kind of culture. They are so fruitful that the Egyptians are threatened by their numbers. The Pharaoh in this part of the story gives Jewish midwives an order to kill the baby boys, which they bravely ignored. So he followed it with an order for all newborn Hebrew boys to be thrown in to the Nile. Enter Moses the hero on a hero's journey. Moses the spared baby in a basket. Moses who grew up a member in the court of Pharaoh, the ruler, the king, the intermediary for the gods was Pharaoh, commander in chief of all Egypt. Moses who grew up with a foot in both worlds, perhaps not quite knowing who he was and how he fit in. Moses who killed an Egyptian in outrage over injustice and fled the country. Moses who came to rest in the foreign land of Midian, married the Korah and became a shepherd. Moses who saw a burning bush and very, very, very reluctantly heard and follow God's call to go and free the Hebrew people. Isn't there anyone else you can send, says Moses. But I think there was for Moses his own call to freedom in this. The Exodus story is all about freedom and liberation from bondage. But there was a call to Moses. Freedom to finally claim his own heritage and connect with his Hebrew roots and family. Freedom from the fear of being killed that remained from his flight to Egypt, from Egypt. Freedom to find his voice, his leadership, and who God created him to be. And after Moses returns to Egypt, he connects with his brother Aaron and sister Miriam. He is asked for Aaron to be the spokesperson of this duo. And Moses and Aaron go to speak to the Pharaoh as the Lord had said and told him, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go so they may hold a festival in my honor in the wilderness. Pharaoh's heart, however, remained hard, and he refused to listen. And so the plagues begin. The water of the Nile and all surface water turned into blood, and the fish died. And Pharaoh's heart was hard. Moses asks again, and Pharaoh denies, and there is a plague of frogs. This one always makes me laugh a little bit until I read about and imagine for a minute the piles of stinking dead frogs. And Pharaoh hardened his heart when the plague of gnats arrived. And Pharaoh would not listen, and Moses asked, and the plague of flies arrived everywhere but in the land of Goshen, where the Hebrew people lived. And God made a distinction between his people and Pharaoh's people. Then the livestock of the Egyptians became diseased and died, and the Egyptian people became covered with festering boils, followed by the worst hailstorm that had ever come to Egypt, followed by locusts who ate the crops, and a darkness that covered all of Egypt for three days. And still, Pharaoh would not let these people go. And in the rhythm of this story, which is poetry kind of in its own right, Moses and Aaron, this is the one depiction of the hailstorm. Part of what I loved about that is just the idea of this as a metropolis in a way maybe I hadn't imagined, but just the, the might and the power of that hailstorm in the Egyptian landscape. But in this rhythm, Moses and Aaron consistently followed God's instructions to ask for freedom for the Hebrew people to go and worship God. Sometimes Pharaoh appears to allow this and then either adds a condition or changes his mind. And all of the plague narratives, it either says that Pharaoh's heart remained hardened or that the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. What does all of that mean? Why would God continue to escalate? That was the only word I can think of. This was just escalation, right? 
Does God have the power to harden or to soften Pharaoh's heart? I think that there are also invitations and calls to freedom in this part of the narrative for the Hebrew people and for Pharaoh. Not just for the Hebrew people to be freed, but to find their way to freedom. At this point, slavery is all that they have known for 20 generations. This is life. This is where their people are, their things are, things are. To let go of what they have known, what may seem like a painful but secure existence. After the first plague, Pharaoh raises the workload on the Hebrew slaves and they push back hard against Moses. Why are you making our lives harder? They too had to be convinced of the power and the faithfulness of God. And Pharaoh too is being offered a kind of freedom. Freedom from being an oppressor of people. To acknowledge a God that is bigger than he is. You can see that wrestling and read that wrestling in the story. Pharaoh is God. He is the ruler of all the gods. And here is a God who has more power than he is. There are a couple places he asks for a blessing from that God and then denies it again. He's really having to figure this out. Pharaoh has the freedom to listen to his own heart, and he doesn't. And we have a place of hardening and softening there. And there's another answer to this escalation that can be found in Exodus 10. Then the Lord God said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart, that I may show these signs of mine among him, among them, and that you may tell them in the hearing of your children and your children's children how I have toyed with the Egyptians and what signs I have done among them, that you may know I am the Lord. So it appears that one of God's larger purposes in all of this is to make God's power and might known. How should I? in a way that no one will again forget. To create a story that will be told again and again and every year across generations and centuries and really millennia, because here we are telling the story. And we remember it's a story out of ancient history and a culture without written language, yet this story is incredibly detailed, vivid, celebrated, remembered. And it's such an essential part of our Hebraic tradition and our understanding of God's character. This is a God of covenant, of power, of might, and of freedom. What can we learn from this? What can we take from this part of the story for our own lives? From this odd narrative of plagues and persistence. We could start with the question, what would a plague look like in our own 21st century lives? But I think we answered that a few years ago. We've seen it in the Flint water crisis. We've seen it in the coronavirus and what happened out of that. But a plague may look like divorce, addiction, foreclosure, job loss, the unexpected death of a loved one. Just one of those modern day plagues can rock us back on our heels. What does it mean? What should we do? We endure, we mourn, we respond and react, we battle, we give up. Perhaps our hearts soften a bit towards others in similar circumstances where questions offer often, why now? Why me? Perhaps one of the responses to the situation is our own hardening of heart. I'll never trust anyone again. Love is not worth it. I guess life will not get better. I'm not going to believe anyone. If the situation improves, our memories dim, the pain lessens, and we begin to forget. We forget our own story years ago, much less our ancestors 20 generations ago. Until, of course, the next plague, or the next wave of the same plague, comes again. can't tell you how many times I've asked the question when faced with the umpteenth iteration of a situation. What is God trying to teach me? What am I failing to learn? But perhaps the question needs to be, from what is God trying to free me? 
there's an old axiom that says this, we don't change until the cost or pain of staying the same exceeds the pain of changing. But what if walking through the pain of change brings you to new freedom? What if the God who rescued the chosen people from slavery can rescue you? What if you knew, really knew, that Jesus was by your side in all things? What if you knew, really knew, that people who care about you will help and bear your burden if you ask them? What if you knew, really knew, that nothing can separate you from the love and the grace of God? Could you move through even the toughest of plagues and toward the freedom that God gives you with your back strong and your heart soft? And what if, as Christ calls us to love God ourselves and one another, the greatest act of faith is to keep our hearts soft in every circumstance, to let the love of God flow in and soften our hearts and let that flow out into the world. May we, people of God, walk through life together with strong backs and soft hearts toward the freedom and adventure of our own exodus. Please pray with me. God, may we hear your call to freedom from those things that enslave us. Fear, hurt, anger, anxiety, habit, doubt, sin, all of the things that separate us from you. May we recognize our plagues as invitations to let go and follow you to the promised land. May we walk forward in trust of your might, your goodness, and your power. May we move in the world with our backs strong and our hearts soft in the way of Christ. Amen. As we prepare to close in worship today, we're going to do a video song for our last one. You're welcome to stand or sit, and it's one called The Goodness of God, and I think that's such a big part of the faith of Joseph, of the faith of the Hebrew people, and the faith of the Israelites through this time.
praise and their their goodness is running after me. We see that in these stories, how the goodness of God keeps pursuing the Hebrew people across time, across generations. As their story unfolds, may we feel the same in our own lives. So with grace and peace, my friends, into the world. Amen.